Pastor Glenn is out of town this weekend. Um, he's been gone for a few weekends. Him and uh, his wife, Kimberly, have sort of been on a Purpose Church speaking tour. They uh, were at our Kalispell campus in Montana for a while preaching. Uh, actually, today, Pastor Glenn is preaching at one of our partner churches in Arco, Idaho. Um, but he is so excited to be back. He misses you all. He is so excited to be back here next Sunday. In fact, he is teaching a message uh, on immigration from the perspective of Deuteronomy. So it's not going to be controversial or anything at all. Um, but really, it's, it's, it's going to be a great time, and I, I really would encourage you to make sure you guys are here. Also want to welcome those of you that are joining us online. Um, we have hundreds and hundreds, sometimes a thousand people joining us online that are a part of our community, so we're really glad that you are with us. And those of you that are here in the room, welcome. Again, thanks so much for being here. Uh, as we continue our series in the book of Deuteronomy, we're getting towards the end, and what I want to talk about today is wisdom. I want to talk about what it looks like to take small steps of faith that ultimately produce a big faith within us. I was, uh, I was in Thailand recently, and I came across this quote. I want to start with this quote. It goes like this. If you haven't, and this is a specifically Thai quote, it says, if you haven't tasted cow soy or seen the view from doi sutape, you haven't been to Chiang Mai. Now, uh, I went to uh, Thailand and I had the opportunity to preach in a few different youth camps over there. I went with Hume Lake and it was an amazing experience. And uh, I got to spend an afternoon with our Purpose Church missionaries, uh, Mike and Becky Mann, who have been there for uh, over 30 years now, I believe. And and they took me to an incredibly authentic Thai restaurant where we had cow soy. Uh, and I'm just going to say it did wonders on my intestines, but it was amazing. It was amazing all the same. And, and then our team, our team decided to, uh, I'm going to use the word hike. I'm going to use the word hike. We, we decided to hike up to the top of uh, Doi Su Tape, which is uh, one of the highest temples, the Buddhist temples in Thailand. In fact, here's what's interesting about uh, Doi Su Tape. It is a national park. It is the eighth tallest mountain in Thailand. Uh, and to get from the bottom to the top, it is over three, or 309 steps. Now, I took this photo. This is me at the very bottom. You can see the top right up there. I took this photo in case I died along the way so that there would be some memory of of, of the accomplishment that I had. And here's the thing. I mean, you guys, and it's just me admitting and being real with you. Um, you don't get this body type from doing 309 steps very often. You know what I mean? So this is sort of a rare occasion for me. But I remember walking up these steps and having this sort of, this, this revelation for me that, you know, there's no other way to get up to this place. I mean, this, this is how you get to the top of this temple. It's one step at a time. I was thinking about, the mountains that I see around us, the mountains I was at a camp speaking um, last week, and I'll share a little bit more about that, but it's surrounded by these beautiful mountains. And, and I looked up at them and I thought, you know, nobody, nobody climbs a mountain in one step, right? It's impossible to get to the top of a mountain in one step. Let me, let me make that spiritual for you. We look at some of the people in our lives who have a really strong, big, bold faith, People who've been following God for a while. And, and we're tempted to say, man, I just want that and I want that right now. But the reality is we don't get to those places unless we are willing to take multiple small steps in the right direction. In other words, living wisely isn't about being in the right place at the right time. That's luck. Living wisely, living a wise life is about choosing the next right step before you. You see, God in his, in his word, he makes it clear to us that he desires a relationship with us and he desires that we would follow him. But it's oftentimes not gonna be these giant leaps and in order for us to get to the mountain, to get to the heights, to get to the sort of depth and the big relationship with God that he desires for us and that we want, we have to be willing to take steps along the way. In Deuteronomy chapter 26, it says this, verse 16. The Lord your God commands you this day to follow these decrees and laws. Carefully observe them. The, wor the word observe means two things. It means to remember and to practice. To remember and to practice. So God desires that we would remember his law, that we would know his law, that we would believe his commands, but that we would actually live them out as well. He continues 
to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse 17, you have declared, this is Moses speaking to the people, you have declared this day that the Lord is your God and that you will walk in obedience to him, that you will keep his decrees, commands, and laws, that you will listen to him. Verse 18, and the Lord has also declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession as he promised, and that you are to keep all his commands. What's clear here is that what God desires with you is a relationship a covenant, a partnership, a commitment. Whereas you are committed to taking every next right step, every small step in his direction, trusting him, leaning into him, you need to know that he has already made a covenant and a commitment with you. That just the fact that you came into this world means that you are marked by his image, that you have value and worth that has been given to you by your creator. He has made a commitment to be invested in your life. And he desires that you would do the same with him. You see, God's heart is that through these small acts of faith that we're going to talk about today, that it would produce in us a big intimacy with God, a closeness with God. Before we jump into the three areas of our lives where I want us to be open and sort of analyze and look at today, I want to share a verse that sort of gives the overarching vision that God has for his people. It's found in Leviticus 19, verse 18. Leviticus 19, verse 18 says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. So early on in the story of the people of God, he says, this is who you are to be. This is the kind of person that I have created and desired for you to be, that you would not seek revenge or bear a grudge. Why? Because God doesn't hold a grudge against us. That as we receive his forgiveness and his love, he's not holding a grudge. He has freed us from that. Instead of acting in revenge, he has chosen to act in sacrifice. And because of that, God says, I want you to hold on to that truth. And I want that to be sort of like an an identity marker for who you are. That you are to love your neighbor as yourself because it is a reflection of the truth that God exists. And that you belong to me. So what I want to do in the next few minutes we have is sort of analyze how does that get brought to life. A few years ago, um, actually when we first got here, I can't remember if it was an anniversary or Valentine's Day, but um, I decided to build Sarah a table. So we had, I, I thought it'd be really cool to build her this coffee table. And I'm telling you guys, I am the worst. I, I don't know if anybody in here loves working with wood and you're like really good at that stuff. Um, man, I am so far from that. I, I, just, I, I literally call people and I'm like, screwing in a light bulb. Is that to the right or the left? Like, how do you do that again? So I, I struggle in that area. But I called my friend Andrew and I was like, hey, I want you to help me. I think it'd be really cool if I built this table for Sarah. And so he came over to the house and we were, you know, building. And when I say we were building, what I mean is like I was kind of standing off at like a safe distance so that no sawdust would get on me. And um, I was kind of watching him build. And then he would every once in a while look at me and be like, hey, c- could, you, uh, could you just hand me that screw over there? And I'm like, what's the screw again? Like, what does that look like? How do I identify that? And he's like, it's over here. So I would give that to him. And I kind of just sat back and like watched him build this. But I remember during the process early on, before we built anything, he told me the plan. He said, here's how we're going to lay it out. Here's how it's going to look. Here's the dimensions. But then what was essential was not just having the plan and the instructions, but actually bringing the thing to life. And I'm convinced that for some of us who have been following Jesus for a while, we have gotten really good at memorizing the instructions, knowing the plans, and yet our life isn't built on them. Our life doesn't reflect them. There's nothing to look at that says, oh yeah, I see the plans, I see the instructions, and I see how the life is reflected in the instructions. And so what I want to talk about is in very practical ways, in very practical ways, how do we go about loving our neighbors? How do we go about actually living wisely, making that, taking that next right step in front of us? Well, let's begin with this. Taking the next right step when nobody is looking. 
So as you're climbing that mountain of faith, as you're growing in your relationship with God, it's going to be very important that you take the next right step when nobody is looking. In Exodus chapter 23, verse 4 and 5, it says, if you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, be sure to return it. Let me just pause here and say, we're going to look at some verses. We're going to look at some passages where the context is very removed from us, right? And, and you're going to read some of these things and go, what is going on here? These were written 3,400 years ago. So I'm going to try to take what was written 3,400 years ago and find some practical applications for us today. But it'll be, it'll be a little interesting as we look at these passages. If you come across your enemy's ox or donkey wandering off, like totally relatable, be sure to return it. Verse five, if you see the donkey of someone who hates you fallen down under its load, do not leave it there. Be sure you help them with it. So early on in the commands given to the people of God is whenever you see one of your enemies Whenever you see somebody who hates you, whenever you see one of their animals in distress, you need to step in and do something. But then Moses broadens this command in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 1, if you see your fellow Israelite, and then later in the passage, he says, anyone residing among you, if you see your fellow Israelites or anyone residing among you, their ox or their sheep strain, do not ignore it. This is significant. Do not ignore it, but be sure to take it back to its owner. The first step in the right direction to living wisely is to look at the areas of your life where nobody else is looking and saying, am I loving my neighbor? I mean, the neighbor's not around here. The, the Israelite, the enemy, the friend, whoever is not around to notice that their ox or their sheep is in trouble. And what God says to his people is, I want you to be the kind of people that are not just doing the right thing when the spotlight is on you. But when no one else would know the difference, choose to do the right thing. Choose to take that next right step. He says, this passage is a way of combating that sort of mantra that some of us live by, which is, it's not my problem, I'm not going to get involved. You see, if we are to be the people of God who are called to love friend, enemies, all people, then we can't live by that mantra anymore. We can't just say, okay, it, it, it's not my problem. It's not my issue. We have to be the people that are willing to step in the gap, even in ways that nobody else would notice, that nobody else would see. So how do you do this? I, I think there's two big ideas. Number one, if we are to call ourselves the people of God, we need to notice the pain in our community. We need to notice the pain of people around us. Think about the places you work. Think about the friends that you have. Think about the coworkers. Think about uh, the soccer environments that your kids are a part of. Think about your schools. Do you notice the pain of the people that are in your community? Are you aware of what they are going through? The coworkers, the people that you're spending so much time with, do you know what's actually happening in their lives? Or are you, as like many Americans are, so busy, so consumed with our own schedules that we have no time for God to move in our lives? You know what? I feel incredibly guilty of that. I feel like oftentimes I am so busy that I don't have time to notice what is going on in the lives of the people around me. Brian Loritz, he says it this way, proximity breeds empathy, distance breeds suspicion. Friends, I understand, especially in light of what's going on this week, it is very tempting to want to retreat, to recoil, to pull back, and to say it's too scary out there. And it is scary. I get that. But how are we to be God's people in the world if we are not willing to be close with people? How, are we call, how, how can we represent him if we're not willing to step into those spaces? I found that the more I connect with people who are different than me, who think different than me, who come from different backgrounds than me, the more I begin to understand where they're coming from and the more the doors swing wide open for me to actually love them. Which leads to the next point that we can't just notice the pain around us and be aware of it, but number two, we need to proactively care for the people in our community. This means your actual neighbors, the neighbors that are closest to you, the people that you are seeing on a weekly basis. We are called as his people to step into their spaces and not ignore what's going on in their lives. 
but to be proactive in our ways that we care for them. Did, did one of your neighbors have a baby recently? What would it look like for you to bring a meal over and care for them? Is there a neighbor who's close to you who is lonely? Would you consider inviting them over for dinner? Is there a teacher at the school that your kids or your grandkids go to that you could bring them Starbucks and, and pay extra attention to them and love on them and pray for them and encourage them? You see, it's in these very practical steps of faith, these small steps of faith, that God is going to build something big in us. He's going to actually change us from the inside out. Which is why I think this is true, and I'm going to just pause on this for a second. It's really hard for someone to believe that God loves them if you as his representative have not loved them. Just think about that for a second. I'm going to say it again. It is really hard for someone to believe that God loves them if you and me as his representatives have not loved them. There's a calling in that. There's an invitation in that. To say, you know what? I may not understand this group of people. I may not get this. We may have very different views when it comes to X, Y, and Z. But by golly, I'm going to love them. I'm going to serve them. I'm going to be there for them. I'm going to step in the gaps for them. Because the only way that they are going to see God's love for them is if I show up because, heck, I'm the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. If, if Christ wants to manifest his love for these people, isn't he certainly going to use his body? And oftentimes we resist that. We move away from that. And I'm the biggest sinner in the room when it comes to that. But I want to challenge us as a community to lean in to that. Jesus says in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 3, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So again, it's not this idea. In fact, Jesus implies that you are going to give to the needy. That as a follower of Jesus, you're going to give to the needy. It's not optional. But how you do it is. And Jesus wants to say, the way in which you do it should not draw attention to yourself, but should point all the glory back to God. Friends, I want to ask you this question. How can you, how can you be a blessing in blank? I want you to think about what is that blank for you? Is it your school? Is it your job? Is it your friendships? Is it your environment? Is it your neighborhood? Where can God use you this week to be a blessing? It's something we tell our kids every single day. In fact, we have this little wall that says Holmstrom Family Values. And value number two is be a blessing. We tell our kids every time before we leave the house, whenever we drop them off, we say, Brinley, Charlie, what's your job? Be a blessing, right? What's your job? Be a blessing. What if this week, what if this week you could be a blessing and keep that little secret between you and Jesus? What if you could step into some kind of space, some kind of environment, some kind of relationship and say, this week I am going to be a blessing here. In Deuteronomy 22.10, it says, do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. <laughs> What does that mean, right? Do not plow with an ox, with an ox and donkey yoked together. The scholars think there's two things going on here. Number one, the donkey and the ox had unequal strengths with one another. So in practical terms, to, to tie together an ox and a donkey and move them in the same direction to plow a field was not very productive. But there's a second deeper illustration and metaphor here. For the Israelites, the ox was considered a clean animal. And the donkey was considered unclean. I think one of the things that Moses is teaching his people here that God has given him to share is that there can be the temptation, when we're talking about nobody looking, there can be the temptation for us to portray some image of our lives, some image of how everything is going right and great and we have no issues and no struggles when behind the scene there is some uncleanliness. There are some things going on. I want to challenge you. When you look at maybe your Instagram feed or where you're posting, the stories you're telling about your life, are there other stories that sound a little bit like, when my wife's out of town, this is what I'm really doing? Or when people think I'm at this business meeting, I'm actually at the bar. 
Or I have this secret sin that I have not confessed to my spouse or to anyone close to me. And I portray this image that everything's okay. The field is getting plowed. But there is some uncleanliness. There is some brokenness. There is some issues that need to be dealt with. Can I, can I just offer this to you that God is less concerned with how your field looks and way more concerned with your heart? Way more concerned with the tools that you're using to live your life? You know, at this church, we have an incredible gift in Celebrate Recovery. It's an amazing ministry that offers community for those of us, which is all of us, that have some kind of hurt, habit, or hang-up. It's every Tuesday night, and it's an amazing space for you to come and just say, you know what, I'm broken. I don't have it all together. We have life groups here that are offered all the time. We're going to be launching into some amazing new opportunities to connect this fall in life group. Maybe as you join a life group, you say, you know what, I'm not just going to have shallow surface level conversations, but we're going to really talk about what's actually going on because God cares about those things. So not only do we need to take the next right step when nobody is looking, but number two, we need to take the next right step with our work. I want to read you Deuteronomy 24, 14 to 15. Do not take advantage of a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether that worker is a fellow Israelite or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. Pay them their wages each day before sunset because they are poor and are counting on it. Otherwise, they may cry to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. This phrase, do not take advantage, it's actually stronger in the original language. It means that when you take advantage of somebody, you're literally robbing them. You're depriving them. Because every person is made in the image of God. So every person has value and worth. Let me ask you a question for those of you that are in the workplace in any way. And I'm talking about those of you that are raising kids at home. I'm talking about those of you that are at entry level jobs, that are in management, that are in leadership in some level. Those of you that are in the classroom learning. Can I just ask you this question? Is your leadership and your work ethic pointing people to Jesus? Is the way in which you lead and the way in which you work ultimately showing them Jesus? And, and I, I love what, what Moses is doing here, that God is inspiring him to be really honest about the very practical, small components of life that sometimes as Christians we overlook. We think God mostly cares about being in church and, and doing these big activities. I think God cares about the little small stuff because the little small stuff shapes us. I, and this is just a pet peeve of mine, but sometimes I hear it whenever I'm going to like Starbucks or I'm going to McDonald's or I'm going to like some kale fast food place I've never been to before. Like I hear people in front of me saying a phrase like this, give me. G give me a chai latte. Give me a burger. Give me a fries. Give me, give me, give me. And I think, man, when, whenever my kids say a phrase to me like, give me, I'm like, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> We're not playing that game. You don't say, give me. No. You ask kindly and politely because that matters. Friends, I wonder if we live in this culture where we view our baristas and our servers and, and those who take care of us or watch over us, we use them and we look at them as robots, as, as, as not people. And what would it look like if, if we started to talk to them with such kindness, with love, and what if we could get to know them and, and what if God might actually want to use us in those relationships, but we are just so quick to kind of treat them as commodities, as people who will ultimately give us things. I, I was thinking this week as I was preparing this message and in light of all that's going on right now, I was thinking about our first responders. We have a number of first responders here in our church and, and one, we are just so grateful for you. That whether you're in, in law enforcement or EMT or doctors or nurses or firemen, firefighters, we are so grateful for you. And I know many of you, and I've had the opportunity to hear your stories and do ride-alongs and, and get to know you a little bit. And, and just this week, I was preaching at a Forest Home, and it was an incredible honor to speak at Forest Home this week. We got this little family photo of us, the six of us right there. It was an incredible opportunity to preach at this camp this week because 18 summers ago, I gave my life to Christ at Forest Home. And I got to preach in the high school room where I could see the sit, I could see the seat where I was sitting when I surrendered to Jesus. And it was just an awesome opportunity. And 
I got to know a lot of the youth pastors, and one of them came up to me, and he said, you know, um, before I was a youth pastor, I was a police officer. I said, that's really interesting. He said, yeah, I was a police officer for seven years. And he said, you know, those seven years were really hard. He said, those seven years changed me as a person. And, and maybe this hasn't been your story if you're a first responder, but this was his story. He just said, you know what, during those years, I, I began to grow resentful of people. My, my views towards them really changed. He said, I, I began to assume the worst in people. I began to assume that everybody was out to get me. And then he got really vulnerable and honest, and I was really just touched and, and amazed that he would share this with me. He said, honestly, Eric, there were times where I hated people. Because he saw the worst in people. He saw the worst moments in people's lives. And then he said this to me. He said, but you know, all of that changed for me as soon as I started to talk about it. He said, I, uh, I, I asked a mentor, I asked this guy if he would mentor me. And he was a Navy SEAL and had seen so many things, far more than I had ever seen. And I was sharing with him one day, he was sharing with this Navy SEAL, this mentor of his, about all of his frustrations and the anger and the ways that, that it had infiltrated his, its way into his family life, into the way he interacted with his spouse and his kids. And, and the mentor just said this, and, and maybe this message isn't for you, but this was for him. Maybe it is for you, but this is what he said. The mentor said, you know what the problem is? Is you're choosing the anger. You're choosing the hatred. You're choosing the frustration. And he wasn't denying that the experiences that he was having were frustrating and challenging and that anger was a normal response. But what he was saying is instead of you reaching out for help and talking with people, you're choosing to hold on to that anger and it's affecting everyone around you. But friends, I, I don't know if that's just true for first responders. I think that's true for a lot of us. I think we have some parents in the house who raising kids is not what you thought it was going to be. And they have tried you and stretched you and challenged you. And you look at these beautiful image, you know, these image bearers of God and you're like, they're a Tasmanian devil is what they are. <laughs> and you're frustrated at them. Or, or you've got people at work that just make you want to run to a different country. You've got things going on, people that are stretching you and challenging you, and, and it just is so difficult for you. Maybe is it possible that you're choosing to hold on to the anger? That you're choosing to hold on to the resentment? Can I ask all of you that are parents, that are coworkers, and that are first responders, as you courageously live in the other areas of your lives, as you're, as you're courageous in rescuing and serving and caring for others, could you be so courageous as to seek help? to ask for advice, that if things are getting hard, to reach out and seek that kind of wisdom and that encouragement so that you might look at the people that you serve, that you work with, that you work for as those that are created in the image of God. No matter how difficult they make your life, God loves them, God knows them, and God cares about them. The second idea within taking the next step with your work comes from Deuteronomy 24, verses 21 to 22. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. I love here, God, God is saying, look, after you've sort of collected all the grapes, you could go back and see if you missed a few and collect more, and that might make you a little bit more wealthy. But I desire that your company, that your business, that the thing that you lead would actually be a blessing to more people than just yourself. I mean, what, what would it look like if, if you viewed the company that you lead, the team, the division that you're a part of, the organization that you lead? What if you asked the question, God, how can this not just build my wealth, but how can it build your kingdom? And what if that's one of the reasons God has placed you in the unique position of power and leadership and authority is not just so that you would get wealthy, but so that your leadership would ultimately result in the blessing of others, not in the building of your wealth alone, but in the building of God's kingdom. I mean, I think about this for teachers. What would it look like if in the classroom, you're going, God, how do I build your kingdom here with these little ones? Those of, you, those of you that are in a management level or running a business, what would it look like to say, God, I want and desire that you would use all my talents and skills 
for something bigger than myself, something even bigger than this company. Let me ask you this question. How is your organization, your team, your leadership, your business, how are you strategically planning on blessing others? See, God gives them a very practical way to strategically bless others. Don't go back through the grapes. Let it bless others. In your organization, in your business, in your company, in your context, what does it look like for you to strategically bless others? And then number three, lastly, take the next right step as you're climbing that mountain that is not just one step but many steps. Take the next right step for the powerless. Now, I'm going to read a verse right now that I, I imagine you've never read before in church, okay? So get ready. This is one of those awesome verses in Scripture that we don't read a lot, but we're going to read it here in church. It is Deuteronomy 24, 16. Parents are not to be put to death for their children. Children. Amen. <laughs> right? If you have kids, amen. Nor children put to death for their parents. Some of you are like, amen. Each will die for their own sin. God's word. Okay. Each will die for their own sin. As I was studying this week, I just felt like this verse was on my mind and heart. And I was like, okay, God, what do you want to say? And the thing I felt like he was trying to say is there are times where really, really great, awesome, dialed-in, intentional parents have challenges with their kids, right? Have challenges with their students. As a youth pastor, as a youth pastor, I see this a lot. I see really, really amazing parents who have seasons of challenge with their students. And, and parents, let me remind you of something, and, and, student, or, uh, and congregation, let me remind you of something, that teenagers, and teenagers, I'm not offending you here, I'm loving you in this way, watch, you'll see it. Teenagers are half-brained individuals, okay? They're half-brained individuals. Here's what I mean by that. Here's what I mean by that. Literally, their frontal lobes have not developed all the way, and so teenagers are half-brained. They're doing a great job. They're trying their hardest, you know what I mean? But they're half-brained. They're gonna get there. All of you guys did. You will get there. But what I was thinking about is oftentimes, it can be so easy to sort of stand back and to look at a parent who's having a troubling, challenging time with their student and to judge them and to heap guilt and shame on them and to be so critical of them. And then I'm reminded of Galatians 6 2, where Paul says, carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. See, some of you, some of you have challenging parents. Some of you have parents that have made life very difficult for you. And maybe, maybe you've experienced people looking down on you or being critical and judgmental of you because of your parents. Or maybe it's vice versa. Maybe you, your kids are going through a challenging season and time right now and you, you've experienced people guilting you or shaming you for that. Can I just remind you as the body of Christ that we're called to be better than that? That we're not called to heap guilt and shame on each other. We're actually called to carry each other's burdens. Can I ask you a question? What would it look like for you to noticing and knowing that some people are struggling with their kids or struggling with their parents? What would it look like for you to ask the question, how can I relieve this burden from them a little bit? How can I step in and help? How can I lighten their load? Because none of us are perfect at this. A few years ago, I was speaking at a camp, and it was towards the end of the camp, and so I had become really good friends with the, the youth pastors and the leaders and the students, and we were having an amazing time, and, and our kids were there with us, Sarah was there, we were all having a great time, and, and Charlie had just learned how to swim, and, and he just loved jumping off the diving board. He would get to the diving board, and he would jump off and make this big splash, and it was so much fun. He loved it, and, and I remember on this day, it was just really hot, and everybody seemed to be at the pool on this day, and, and so Charlie steps up to the diving board, and he goes, hey, hey, and starts like kind of shouting, right? This is my seven-year-old son. He kind of shouts. And so all eyes are on him. And this is what he said. And I know as I say this, some of you are going to judge me and you're going to, this is so sacrilegious. I get it, but I just have to tell you. He stood up to the diving board and no joke, before he jumps in, you know what he says? He says this, he goes, it is finished. <laughs> he just quoted Jesus's last words. Like, on the cross, Charlie, with his floaties on, screams, it is finished, jumps in the water, and all eyes are on Sarah and I. And I'm like, that blood is on his hands. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> he's going to pay for that, not me. You know what I mean? I mean, I did not teach him to say that kind of stuff, right? We all have those moments, right? 
We have those moments, whether it's with people we're rooming with or people we're in class with or our own kids, our own parents, where we're just like, oh, and it can be really frustrating. But if you know somebody in your life who's struggling in that way, can I just challenge you to resist the temptation to judge, to resist the temptation to gossip and to say, oh, my kids would never do that. And instead, ask the Christian question. God, how can I help carry their burden? God, how can I fulfill the law of Christ in that way? Lastly, when it comes to the powerless, because there's those moments where it just feels like as a parent or as a kid, we're powerless. It can also feel that way when it comes to justice. In Deuteronomy 24, 17 to 18, do not deprive the foreigner or the fatherless of justice or take the cloak of the widow as A pledge. Verse 18. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That is why I command you to do this. God's clear in his scripture that if you see somebody who does not have a voice, that it is your job to be their voice. That if you see an injustice happening as the people of God, knowing that God wants to right that wrong, that God wants to make that a just situation, it is our job to step in. I think about Pastor Tamiko and the amazing ministry she runs, Everyone Free, that works to help prevent human trafficking, to care for the, to meet those who are being rescued from human trafficking, and to do follow-up care with those who are being trafficked. I want you to think about in your areas of influence, where is there injustice? Where is there people being taken advantage of? Where are the powerless voiceless? And know that it is your holy mandate to speak up, to be the voice for those that don't have a voice. So how how do we kind of flesh this out? And as the worship team wants to come up and lead us in one last song, how, how do we flesh this out? I just want to look at Solomon's life. I want to look at these few verses that Solomon said that were so powerful for thinking about how to actually apply, how, how, to, how to take that next step. And he says this in 1 Kings 3, 7 and 9. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David. But I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart. Three quick big ideas. Number one, be humble. Be humble. Solomon says, I'm like a child. I think pride is one of the things that keeps us on that first step, keeps us from taking those 309 steps, keeps us from climbing that mountain and growing in our faith. It's pride. Number two, he, he talks about the people of God, not as an annoyance or a frustration or a challenge or an obstacle or a thing to be avoided, but he views them as a great people. Th- think big with me. That God actually wants to use the challenging circumstances in your life. He he wants to use the obstacles. He wants to use the difficult relationships. He wants to use all of it to help you take those steps of faith, to help you live wisely, to help you become the person that he's creating you to be. Think big and view the people in your life as great, as opportunities, even those people that are so challenging. To view them as an opportunity to grow. And number three, number three, he asks God for a discerning heart, which in the Hebrew is literally to say he was asking God for a hearing heart, for a heart that could hear God's voice. Friends, nobody climbs a mountain in one step. But together, we can go step by step in the right direction knowing that all of the little areas of our lives matter deeply to God and that God will use the small things, the small moments, the small interactions to produce a big faith within us. Would you stand and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We love you. We recognize that you are here in this place moving and ask God that that you would help us along the way, that you would help us along the journey as we follow you and become the people you've created us and called us to be one step at a time. 
In Jesus' name we pray, amen.